Well, today we're going to be kicking off a brand new sermon series. It's going to last for the next three weeks. I hope that you'll find it interesting. It is named after our cause here at Legacy Nashville, and the name of our cause and our sermon series is For the Sake of Eternity. Would you guys say that with me? For the sake of eternity. If anybody ever asks you, what is that church like that you go to? Why in the world is Legacy Church a church at all? You can respond to them and say, for the sake of eternity. We exist for the sake of eternity. So what I want to do today is kick off this sermon series called For the Sake of Eternity. Um, I'm going to do kind of an intro message on the subject that I feel as your pastor would be good soil to start with. And then next week, my intent is to talk about eternity um, a little differently than you might expect. I am preparing to share a message on hell. And then the following Sunday, I am preparing to share a message on heaven. And so I want you to just buckle up because the next three weeks uh, may feel slightly turnt in the spiritual dimension. And we are okay with that because that's what legacy is like. And, and so today what I'd like to do is I would... Um, like to build a firm foundation. Okay. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm messing around. Uh, our text today is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. I'm um, going to spend most of my time in those 10 verses of Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. But um, as you're finding it, and standing to your feet, I want to let you know we're going to begin with 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 as a setup. So it's kind of an alley-oop for where we're going in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I wanted to zoom out just a little bit and provide some additional context for our pilot passage today, which is chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. All right, we're going to begin in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18, and then there'll be a segue into chapter 5. How many of you know that whenever Paul wrote this letter, he did not say, okay, that's chapter 5. That's verse 18. It was just one letter. All right, so we're going to read it um, as part of one text. So read it out loud with me if you don't mind. So we do not... Say that again. So we do not... Come on, you have every excuse to be encouraged today in the name of the Lord. We don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now stop right there just for a moment. I want you to realize what Paul is doing here. He is saying no matter how big your problems are in this life, they are only light, momentary afflictions when you hold them up next to the glory that is on its way, the eternal weight of glory. The other thing I want you to notice real quick about what Paul is saying here is that the light momentary affliction that we endure is preparation. Preparation for what is to come because what is to come is glory. Somebody say glory. Beyond all comparison. Somebody say beyond all comparison. Look at your neighbor say that's where you're headed. As we look not to the things that are, but to the things that are. See, Paul's now telling us where we need to put our focus. Where do you need to gaze? Do not look to the things that are, but to the things that are. For the things that are, are transient, but the things that are, are, are 
For the sake of? Verse five. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Woo! For in this tent we groan. Does that sound like your life right now? Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it does for somebody. In this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, why? Being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. What's Paul saying? He's saying this body is nothing more than a tent when you compare it to what you will have on the other side. That's going to be a building. And it's going to be so glorious that if you compare it with what you look like today, you are naked and ashamed. No matter how good you look on your best day, by comparison to how you're going to look in the eternal dimension, you are only naked and ashamed. So, so somebody just got offended. They said, I look good today. I smell good today. I steamed out my outfit today. That's just a tent. That is nothing by comparison to the glorious building that you're going to have on the other side whenever you are swallowed up by life. Next verse of Scripture. Last one here. Verse 10. This is it? Oh, that's it? Oh, they changed it. Okay, yeah, you can go next one. My bad. I was looking for, I was looking for verse 10 down there. My fault. My bad, Tia. Um, he who has... It's, it's preparation time. I think you got to remember about this life. This ain't all there is. This is a time of preparation. He who has prepared for us... This very thing is who has given us what? Spirit. As what? Woo! That's a down payment on your home in eternity right there. That is nice. It's under contract. Got my property in heaven under contract. You know how I know? I got the Holy Ghost. That's what Paul is teaching. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Paul is not denying the presence of God in reality, but he is saying the way that we see and experience Jesus today is nothing by comparison to how we will see and experience Jesus on the other side. For we walk by, not by... Yes, we are of, see that, don't lose heart. Be of good courage, be of good courage. I know you're groaning right now. I know you're going through some afflictions right now, but they are light and they are momentary. Be of good courage, says the Lord, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to do what? It's our goal. Last verse. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, this is going to be uncomfortable, but look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about you. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, you need to remember that. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Maybe not me, I'm a Christian. No, there's two different judgments. In the New Testament, there's the judgment seat of Christ, which is referred to as the Bema seat. It's the seat that the judge at the Olympics would sit at to see who would cross the finish line first. Each and every one of us are going to appear before the Bema seat of Christ. We're going to face Christ and we will receive judgment according to his standards, not our own. 
But there's another judgment, which is the great white throne judgment, and that will be the judgment for the unsaved. And that's the judgment that Jesus talks about when he says God will separate the sheep from the goats. So that each one may, what is, for what he has, where? In the body, whether good or so what I want to do today, if you just really extend a lot of grace, is I want to share with you a teaching I've prepared called the eternal dimension. How's that sound? The eternal dimension. Lord, we are grateful that you've given us eyes to see and ears to hear. Father, I pray right now that every spirit be opened and that we would be ready to receive the seed of God, the word of God. We declare now in Jesus' name, it will fall on good soil. It will not be burned up by the wayside on the way home. But the soil is good, we declare today in the name of Jesus. Any hard-heartedness as Pastor Brian prayed during the worship, I pray that the soil be turned over now in the name of Jesus, that it be watered now by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, that the seed would be supplanted, that it would be sown by the hand of the Lord, that it would go into the depth that it needs in order to germinate so that breakthrough can come and fruitfulness becomes an eventuality. Lord, we are proclaiming today that the seed that goes forth, that it will bear much fruit. You don't sow sparingly, God, and I am thankful today for your generosity. So sow your seed in me today, Jesus, I pray. Put your seed in my spirit. Lord, I, I just pray that you would help me steward the conditions for germination, God. I pray that you would help me to be obedient, to water this seed today. I declare in Jesus' name that this is a fruitful house and that this seed will bear 100-fold fruit today. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said... Amen and amen. You can be seated. If you want, you can keep your Bible open. If you have an app, you can keep it open. If you want it, so long as your phone is not a distraction because we're going to dive deep here for a little bit and uh, you'll need to focus. But if you've got your physical Bible, you want to keep it open, that's fine. You can do that. The eternal dimension we're teaching today. The Bible teaches this about eternity that you exist in two realities. You exist in two realms. You exist, present tense, in two dimensions. You have the dimension of the natural, which is the flesh, the body, our senses, right? This is what Paul is teaching today. And we have the dimension of the eternal, the spirit, heaven. It's what Paul is teaching today. So I wanna talk a little bit about the eternal dimension because I want you to know that present tense, you exist in two dimensions. There is the you that I can see and there is the you that I cannot see. I can see your physical form, I can see your body, I cannot see your soul, I cannot see your spirit. But the Bible teaches us that we exist in two realities, two realms, and two dimensions. Is this weird already? So you're like, yeah, 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 it's weird, it's weird. Um, I, I, I took this screenshot from a popular movie, Interstellar. Five people have seen it, obviously. But in Interstellar, there is five dimensions. I, I know that because I read a blog about it. I couldn't figure it out when I watched the movie. I don't know about you. Don't you dare lie in church like you had it all figured out. People are like, oh, you don't understand Inception? Bro, the guy who wrote Inception don't understand Inception. But I just thought I'd show you that because if you like Interstellar and you're all into the five dimensions, I'm like, shoot, two dimensions going to be a piece of cake for you. So be encouraged in the house of the Lord. You got this. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got this. So 
one of the things you're gonna see Jesus do all the time in the gospels when he's teaching is you will see him creating comparisons. He does this all the time on purpose. And it's actually a facet of brilliant teaching. I try my best to be a good teacher. And I believe that being a good teacher is taking complicated things and making them simple. When, when you hear from a bad teacher, they'll take simple things and make them complicated. But I am grateful that whenever Jesus instructs his people on how to live or when he gives a parable illustrating what his kingdom is like, he'll oftentimes give us some comparisons and he'll say like, this is the good thing and this is the bad thing, right? And then he'll give us an invitation, an opportunity to commit ourselves to his principles and choose the good thing. Sometimes it's not between good and bad. Uh, sometimes it's just between like good and best. He's like, that's good, but this is better. Sometimes it's, um, you've heard it said, right? Something that was said yesterday, but now I say something that is being said now. I want you to choose what I'm asking you to choose today, not what I spoke to you about in the past once upon a time. This is what Jesus does. He creates these comparisons, and it's actually a benchmark of brilliant teaching. I try to borrow uh, from Jesus anytime I can. It's one of the reasons why I use the limbo uh, stick. Um, some of you are trying to remember when that story was in the Gospels right now. <laughs> when did Jesus get a limbo stick at? Right before the Last Supper. Come on, John. <laughs> JK, JK. Um, but, but Paul, the Apostle Paul, he does the same thing. You'll see him do this all the time throughout the epistles where he'll create comparisons and contrast because he's trying to teach us the difference between the two things. It's like uh, synonyms and antonyms. It's like, okay, here's the definition of a term and here's the opposite of that term so that you can more clearly understand the true and real definition of the thing that I'm trying to teach you about. Are you with me? And so what the Apostle Paul does in the 12 verses of Scripture that we read was he actually creates nine evident comparisons between these two dimensions. So when I say the eternal dimension, I know that sounds crazy, but the Apostle Paul has actually given us nine different opportunities, at least nine, to see the difference in the natural dimension and the eternal dimension. You might say the dimension of the flesh and the dimension of the spirit. Everybody say the natural. Everybody say the spiritual. These dimensions are both real. Do you believe that? And one dimension is more superior to the other. And that is the dimension of the spirit, not the dimension of the flesh. This is why Paul says in his letter to the church at Corinth, here's the dimension that I want you to focus on. I don't want you to focus on the things that you can see. I don't want you to focus on the dimension of the flesh. I don't want you to focus on the things that you can see, touch, taste, smell, or spend money on. I don't want you to live for that, right? I want you to focus on the dimension of the unseen, the eternal dimension, the spiritual dimension, because as Christians, we should care more, Paul says, about what's happening in this dimension, the dimension of the spirit, than we do what's happening in this dimension, the dimension of the flesh, because it's transitory and it's temporary. Life is but a vapor, the Bible teaches. So no matter how long you live, you may be a centenarian. Is that how you say a, somebody who lives past 100? Centurion? Centenarian. Even if you live to 150, you know, you, you, your life is still just a vapor. That's it. It's just a vapor. And so Paul is telling you, look, you have a little bit of time in this life. It may seem like a long time. 80 years may seem like a long time. 100 years may seem like a long time, but it's actually just a very short time. And in this short time, you've been given an opportunity in relationship with the Holy Spirit to prepare yourself and allow the Holy Spirit to prepare you so that when you step into this superior dimension called eternity, you are prepared to receive all of what Christ wants to give you. 
Does this make sense? Are we together? So let's look at a chart. I made a chart. I thought that'd be easy. So uh, just in the verses of Scripture that we read today, Paul is creating a contrast between the dimension of the flesh and the dimension of the spirit. The outer self is the flesh. The inner self is the spirit. The body and the spirit. This is chapter 4, verse 16. If your Bible is out, you can read it again. He also then compares our experiences in the flesh and our future experience in the spirit. He says, while we're in the flesh, we're going to experience light affliction. I know you think you're going through some stuff, but by comparison to where you're headed, by comparison to where you're headed, I'm telling you right now, when your feet are planted on the streets of gold and, and the legacy band is up there and, you know, Jasmine is singing and you're going to start dancing, I can guarantee, and you're not going to think about what you experienced in 2024, no matter how bad it was. You're like, oh, that was a momentary light affliction. That was no problem. Let me go ahead and get that dirt off my shoulder. Glory, verse 17. Okay, here's the next one. This is momentary. Life is, is just a moment, whereas uh, verse 17 says, the spirit realm is eternal. The realm of the flesh is the seen realm, and the realm of the spirit is the unseen realm. Verse 18, here's four, here's five more. The seen realm is a realm that is transient. What does that mean? We're just passing through. You know, people call Nashville a transitory city. It's like people just pass through the city all the time. Every single person that is alive, they are just transitioning, just in transit. This is just your commute on the way to glory. And, it, and it's much shorter than you think it is. Contrast by the eternal. Uh, the dimension of the flesh, Paul calls it a tent. Uh, and then he says the dimension of the spirit, he calls it a building. Now this one in particularly, I got so stoked on because I hate camping. Some of y'all, I, I bless you in the name of the Lord. You're amazing. I love you. Like you're out at REI, it's just getting stuff. They sell like a bunch of rope. Why do you need all that rope? Where are you going, bro? Like, you know, Bear Grylls out here, man. Like, what do y'all even do with all that stuff? Stuff everywhere. Here's a water purifier. You can drink out of the river. What, you do that for fun? Or like, where are you going, bro? Like, Uh, you could just fill the camel back up. Like, I'm unsure of your plans for the weekend. It's wild. Are you coming back or like, what are we doing? I don't like camping. You know, I used to do it when I lived in Africa because we'd go out on outreaches and we'd stay in tents. Tents, they're hot. It's like a tiny vinyl sauna, just in there, sweating. There's no refrigerator. Your water bottle gets hot. There's no showers, just dirty. Like the best thing you've got is baby wipes. So I read this and I'm like, praise God. Because if this life, the experience that I'm having in this life, no matter how glorious it might be, if this old flesh is a nothing more than a tent, because what God is preparing for me is a building, I'm like, man, I like buildings. You know what I'm saying? Like, I like nice hotels. I like going to the Four Seasons. I like picking up the phone. Like, yo, let me get that brioche French toast. You know what I mean? Like, warm the syrup up. You ain't getting that at a KOA campgrounds. <laughs> Stayed at a hotel uh, in Portland this past week. They had a little button on the tray that you could push when you were ready for them to come pick up the plate. That's amazing. I give God praise. Sorry if you're a camper in here. All right, a few more comparisons. Earth and heaven. Mortal and eternal life. Sight and, y'all say this one with me. Faith. Say that one more time. Faith. One more time. Faith. Remember that. 
The dimension of faith is the eternal dimension. It's not what you can see. It's not what you can touch. It's not what you can taste or what you can smell. When we talk about faith, we're talking about something that exists in the eternal dimension. It's not intangible. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not sight. Doesn't exist in the dimension of the flesh. Faith exists in the dimension of the spirit, in the eternal dimension. Are you with me? Maybe you've heard somebody say before, uh, in the natural or in the spirit, I see something happening for you, brother, in the spirit. I'm telling you, if you grew up Pentecostal, you got that prophetic word in the parking lot every single Sunday on your way to Shoney's. I see it happening for you right now in the spirit. It ain't happened in the natural yet, says the Lord. But in the spirit, I see Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. See, the atmosphere just shifted. You can tell how many charismatics we got in the room there. Something is happening in the spirit. Yay. Hey. Hey. That's what I'm talking about. You know, here's what's crazy is that not even the Pentecostals uh, are the only ones who understand this, like something's happening in the spirit. Also, Catholics do, man. I tell you, there's a lot of mystical... Catholic, so uh, if you grew up Catholic in here, you're probably already aware of what I'm talking about. And then uh, there's a whole lot of uh, evangelicals like SBC, uh, you know, I ain't trying to call nobody out, but you're probably like, what in the world is this? Talking in tongues? Witchcraft? Demonic? See, I didn't grow up like y'all, and um, I kind of wish I did have that experience. I had some friends uh, but it was kind of cool to never have to stress over whether or not speaking in tongues was biblical. It was just easier for me to receive. I know that's not everybody's story. And so when I start talking about the eternal dimension, you're like, what in the world is this? Is this some kind of woo-woo spiritualism? Where am I at? I didn't sign up for hot yoga. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. If, if, if you were saved out of spiritualism, you know what I'm talking about right now. I'm gonna go further. If you were saved out of the occult and you're in here right now, we're, we're in the shallow end of the swimming pool. You're like, bro, you ain't, this is elementary, man. When you gonna go deeper, this ain't nothing. Because you know what I'm talking about. Because you know the reality of the spiritual dimension. And you know that it's superior to the natural dimension. And it's real. More so than a lot of professing Christians would care to acknowledge in our culture, in America. See, I used to be in, uh, a missionary in India as well. And that's an Eastern culture, not a Western culture. And so... Teaching what I'm teaching now, there, would be kind of the same to somebody who got saved out of the occult. They would say, what are you talking about, man? Of course we know this. We've been taught this since we were babies. The spiritual dimension is superior to the natural dimension. Now, stay with me here, because the enemy wants you to ignore this message. I promise you he does. Because the enemy wants you to buy into the lie that everything that is spiritual is dark and evil. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, let me show you this. It's the Dewey Rames version. Uh, I chose it just because it didn't use the term gifts. And when it says here, now concerning spiritual things, my brethren, I would have you not be ignorant, right? Now, ignorant was not an insult. He was just saying, I don't want you to be unlearned. I don't want you to be uneducated about the spiritual dimension because the word things, just like the word gifts, which is probably in your Bible, the word gifts, now concerning spiritual gifts, that word gifts is not in the original text, all right? So what Paul was saying is, now concerning the spiritual, I don't want you to be unlearned. Now, concerning the spiritual dimension, church at Corinth, which would have been very influenced 
uh, by what was the origin of Western thought in the Greeks. Now, I don't want you to be unlearned about the spiritual dimension because the spiritual dimension is real and you need to be aware of, its, of, its, uh, of, of what's happening in it because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Right? That's what Paul teaches. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, right? And so Paul wants Christians to understand this eternal dimension. He's saying, church, look, there is so much more to life than what you can see. There is an eternal dimension. And one is, verse 17, chapter 4, beyond all comparison of the other. So we need to remember this, uh, that our faith is firstly spiritual. You guys saw the chart. I had you um, say the word faith. Say faith again. Faith. I had you say it three times because I wanted you to remember where your faith abides. It's in the eternal dimension. It's not in your confession. Now, we know what Romans chapter 10 says, right? If I confess with my mouth and I, if I believe in my heart, that Jesus is Lord, God promises that I am saved. Now, I'm not saved by the act of my confession because if I could be saved just by saying something with my mouth, then I could be saved by a work of the flesh. But there's only one way to be saved and that is by grace alone, right? So it's through my faith. I am confessing that Jesus is Lord because of the faith that is here in the unseen, which is my heart, my soul, my spirit. And so out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth. So I'm confessing that Jesus is Lord because I have saving faith in the unseen realm. Are, are you with me? Is this okay? So I'm not saved by the act of confession. Rather, I'm confessing that God has taken action upon my spirit and saved me by grace through faith. So I'm crying out to Jesus. I'm a sinner. And I need salvation. And what happens? Jesus saves us. Prove it. What do you mean prove it? Well, show me how you are saved. You're like, well, I don't, I, I don't, I mean, uh, do you look any different? Oh, uh, yeah. You talk any different? Yeah. You dress any different? Yeah. But still, like, I mean, is that the evidence? So when you become a Christian, you become a Christian to commit yourself to becoming a better person? No, 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 no. That's not what I mean. I'm not just talking about God, uh, you know, dressing me up on the outside. I'm talking about transformation that has taken place on the inside. So you're telling me that there's been a transformation in the unseen dimension that you're calling the spirit. See, maybe most Christians might look at you like, bro, are you all right? But I'm gonna tell you who doesn't look at you like that, and that's people who are in the cult, in the occult. That's people who are spiritualists. That's people who are using drugs to access the spiritual realm. That's palm readers. That's psychics. That's people channeling dark spirits. They ain't looking at you sideways because they know about the spirit realm more so than most Christians do in our modern westernized American Christian context. But our faith is firstly spiritual. You have to remember that salvation is a divine supernatural miracle. Nothing changes about my flesh. I can get saved and still be sick. What is happening is a divine miracle that's taking place in the unseen eternal dimension. And then I'm confessing with my lips in accordance with the faith in my spirit. I'm saved. And I know that I'm saved. To be a Christian requires faith, which is in the unseen. It's strange. I know this may seem strange that I'm teaching this this morning, but I, I think it's important that we remember the spiritual realities of our own salvation. Because when we get saved, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 says that Jesus delivers us from the domain of darkness. We are relocated in the invisible realm. 
I know this may sound weird, but like the Bible literally says, I'm transferred. Right? It may not anything change about your body. Your tattoos and scars may not disappear. But here's what happens in the unseen realm, in the eternal dimension, in the place of the Spirit. Faith. Whoa. Jesus. He picks you up in the eternal dimension, rips you out of darkness where your destination is hell, and he transfers you into the kingdom of his beloved son where there's love and there's life and there's light and that's all in the unseen realm which is why you're like I feel lighter what happened to you you get some new shoes no I got saved you you seem different I know cuz I've been I've been transferred I've been moved over I just changed my permanent mailing address. My destination is no longer hell. My destination is now a building in the eternal dimension with the Son of God. I might be separated from Him right now in my body, but there is coming a time that the way I know Him in the eternal dimension, which is the realm of the Spirit, I will know Him face to face. I know where I'm going. I know where I'm headed. I'm going to be able to take hold of my Savior. I'm going to live forever because he shared his resurrection life with me. It's not because I have any ability or righteousness within myself, but because he's let me borrow. He's imputed righteousness into me. He's given me his blood. He's paid the price on the cross so that I can step into that dimension with confidence, knowing that I'm not trespassing. Because I have the blood of Jesus upon me. And I'm coming before my Father. Not on the basis of what I've done wrong or in spite of anything I may have done right in this life. I'm coming to the Father with the blood of His Son upon my life. Therefore, I'm accepted, not because of my righteousness, but because of His blood. So I can step into that place rejoicing. Paul says with confidence. I don't know about you, but like, I'm happier. And I got eight minutes left and 16 minutes of notes. You guys okay? When we're saved, we're relocated in the spirit. We're picked up and we're moved by Christ into a different place in the unseen realm. First Peter 2 and 9 says, for he called you out of darkness into is wonderful light. I don't know about you, but I can testify this morning, church. Oh, it's wonderful. How wonderful is it to be in this place? So to say it another way, when you are saved, a miraculous, supernatural, spiritual transformation happens in the unseen eternal dimension. Was that a mouthful? So here's what I'm trying to convince you of this morning, church, is that you are wildly spiritual. You are wildly spiritual. Our faith is firstly spiritual, and you are confessing that you are spiritual when you say you are a believer in Jesus. And you're going to hear that all the time in East Nashville. Well, I'm not religious. I'm just spiritual. And a lot of times Christians are like, bah, they, they, ain't, they ain't spiritual. I know the Holy Spirit. They ain't spiritual. No, they're spiritual. They telling you the truth. They may not be in relationship with the same spirit you're in relationship with, but they are in relationship with a spirit and or spirits. So when somebody says, I ain't religious, I'm just spiritual, believe them. And believe that you know the way into the light that they are looking for as they're fumbling through darkness looking for the hope that you have. Don't be put off by those people and think that you don't have tools to reach them. You know your way in the spirit realm more so than you think you do. 
If you come to Legacy, let me tell you right now, you're a navigator in the glory. I can tell you right now. I, there are so many people in this room that have their pulse on what the Holy Spirit is doing in the invisible realm. It, it's, it's not uncommon after worship, somebody to say, I felt this, I felt that, did you see that? I didn't feel like we got there. Oh, we got there today. We did this today, we did that today. And a lot of times, everybody's right. Y'all can wait just a second. But, 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 but stay up. I, I, I'll, I'll, give you like a, I'll give you a point or something. Just get your tent out and set it up. You'll have enough time. It was in my notes. That doesn't make sense to you, but. A significant issue with modern Western Christianity is that it's not spiritual. It's cultural. This is the, re this is the reason why whenever I do a message like this, people are like, oh, so you're the spiritual guy. Well, I hope so. I'm a pastor. I better be able to help you with your spiritual life because I ain't as good as Tony Robbins. I ain't gonna be able to help you that much. I don't have no seven-figure business to teach you how to do that. I ain't got no six-pack abs, so I ain't gonna be able to help you with that either. If I don't know something about the Spirit... That should give you an excuse to find a different church. Spiritual leaders have to lead in the spiritual. That's a sidebar. But a significant issue with modern Western Christianity is that it's not spiritual, it's cultural. And unfortunately, our current version of evangelical Christianity is mostly cultural, and it's a wee bit spiritual. Our culture today in the West focuses almost entirely on the seen dimension, and sadly, the church has taken bait and followed suit. We're now offering entertaining concerts and self-empowering TED Talks in a consumer-driven atmosphere while culture has become increasingly curious about the unseen spiritual dimension. But unfortunately, the church is barely able to answer their questions. Instead, they learn about the spiritual dimension by reading Harry Potter and listening to Joe Rogan. And that's not the way that it's supposed to be. We are those that should stand between the two dimensions and help people navigate a life life of depth that's more than what their five senses tell them that life is. Our faith is firstly spiritual Christians. And this book, this Bible, this is a spiritual book. That's why it's the most shoplifted book in the world because there's something in people that say, if I could just get a hold of the Bible, maybe I'll find answers for what my insides are looking for. My, my desire that my pain might be absolved, that my grief might be remedied. I am looking for something and I cannot find somebody who can explain to me what is happening in the unseen. I can talk to them about the appetites of my flesh, but who's gonna help me to understand and to untangle the grief that I feel in my soul? So we look to this book. This is a spiritual book. And this is what Paul tells us to do in verse 17 and 18 of chapter 4. Look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. He says again in Colossians chapter 3, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. In the Amplified, Paul says it like this. Set your mind and keep focused habitually on things above, the heavenly things, not on things that are on the earth, which only have temporal value. It's kind of like Jesus said, don't lay up riches and treasures for yourself in the earth where moth and rust can destroy. I want you to lay up treasures for yourself in the eternal dimension in heaven. And this is important for us to remember because if we don't remember it, then we'll live for the wrong dimension will live for what we can see. We'll live for what we can smell, taste, touch, vacation in. 
spend money on, drive. House in the hills, you know, or wherever you wanna live. Like, we'll live our whole lives for that. And we can say, well, I'm a Christian. That doesn't mean you're not gonna face judgment. How you live today determines how you'll live forever. One day you're gonna die. I'm not trying to be morbid. It's just the reality. The studies are conclusive. <laughs> one of one dies. <laughs> We're all headed through that door one day. But here's the truth, not the facts. You don't really die. Your body expires, but you don't really die. You live on in eternity somewhere. And what you choose in this temporary transient body, the realm of the flesh, how you give yourself to what God asks you to give yourself to will determine where you go once you pass through that doorway of death. Either way, you're gonna be judged. Christian or not, it's gonna happen for everybody. I'm just not in a hurry for it to happen to me. And I hope you're not either. And let me help you if you're afraid to fly on an airplane because you're afraid you might die. Can I encourage you? You're more likely to be eaten by a shark than you are to die in a plane crash. Some of y'all are like, shoot, I'm afraid of getting eaten by a shark also. That's why I don't go to the beach. That's why I go camping. <laughs> Miss me with the suntan oil. I'm at REI buying cliff bars. I'm just trying to help somebody because I know some of y'all, you're afraid to get on planes. You're afraid to get in the ocean. Can I tell you that you are more likely to die from a coconut falling off a tree and hitting you in the head at the beach than you are of dying in the ocean being eaten by a shark. That's a true, that's a true stat. It's a true stat. You can look it up. Google it. You know, you're more likely to die of falling off the toilet. It's true. Then you are, I appreciate it, it's good, getting eaten by a shark. Did you know that? You know, you're more likely to die from messy handwriting. The doctor writing your prescription and the pharmacist not knowing what he wrote and giving you the wrong medication and you taking it and you die, then you are of being eaten by a shark. That's true. That's true. You're more likely to die. <laughs> Getting your head stuck in a vending machine. This is also a true stat. Some of y'all are like rethinking your life's choices right now. You're like, I didn't realize I was risking my life for that bag of Cool Ranch Doritos. I get it. They're delicious. But maybe think twice next time your sleeve of Oreos don't fall all the way to the bottom. Because you're more likely to die getting your head stuck in a vending machine than you are getting eaten by a shark. You want to do one more? Uh, you're more likely to die. This is true. This is true, John. You're more likely to die by getting hit in the head with a champagne cork than you are getting eaten by a shark. It's true. Sorry to tell you. But I hope that'll make you feel a little bit more safe when you get in the airplane. 
And like when I go through turbulence, I just think to myself, this is not how I'm supposed to go. But you know, if I do, I know where I'm going. But I got a whole lot of things, Lord, that you promised me that I would do that I have not done yet. And then my wife is like, <laughs> it's like a cat. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says this, and just as it is appointed for a man to die, and after that comes what? Judgment, Judgment right? So yes, even Christians will be judged for what they've done that God calls bad. And it's not up to you what God calls bad. It's up to God. You don't get to subjectively reflect your convictions onto God, and when you get to the seat of judgment as a Christian you don't get to tell Jesus well I lived in accordance with my own principles and what I felt like was right or wrong and I'm a pretty good person he's gonna say no bro you're I didn't ask you to live in accordance to your principles those are far too low you live in accordance to mine and I'm gonna judge you on the basis of how you were obedient to my objective commandments in your life and that's what happens as Christians. And I know that a lot of Christians don't want to believe that because they're like, yo, I've been forgiven. Yeah, but being forgiven does not exempt you from consequences. Somebody needs to hear that. Well, I apologize to them. Well, that doesn't mean you're exempt of consequences. If the cops raid your house and they find drugs, you don't get to tell the cops, well, I didn't mean it. Well, I... Realize you're probably sorry, but you're still going to turn around and get handcuffed. And I think as Christians, sometimes we're like, man, I can live however I want to live because I'm saved. I confess with my lips and I believe in my heart that Jesus is the son of God, that he died on the cross for my sins and he resurrected on the third day. So therefore I am saved. I'm good. I got, I got fire insurance. I ain't going to go to hell. When I die, I'm going to go to heaven. And uh, when I get up there, it's going to be amazing. There's going to be no consequences for how I chose to live after I said yes to Jesus. That's not what the Bible teaches. This is for people who are Christians. How we live today determines how we'll live forever. And here's how we're supposed to live. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Whether we are in heaven or in the earth, we make it our aim to please him. In the flesh or in the spirit, we make it our aim to please him. Whether at home or on the job, we make it our aim to please him. Whether I'm with my friends or I'm with my spouse, I make it my aim to please him. Morning, night, Sunday, Friday, don't matter. Wherever I am and whatever I'm doing, I've got a singular focus, and that is to look at the eternal dimension and say, that is the dimension of my faith. I'm gonna set my eyes on the author and the finisher of my faith. And I know that when I gaze at him, I gaze into the eternal dimension. And he there calls me to himself. Therefore, I'm not looking to the left and to the right. I'm not looking at things that are temporary. I'm not consumed by how much money I can make, although it's good in order for me to steward resources. I've got my eyes focused on Jesus. I'm not looking for how many businesses I can start, although I will start a ton of businesses. I'm looking at Jesus. I'm not looking for, you know, oh my goodness, Jesus, hold on. I got to get married first. No, I'm looking at Jesus and I'm trusting that along the way, as I seek first the kingdom of God, which is in the eternal dimension, all things will be added. The Bible does not say seek all things and the kingdom will be added. It says seek the kingdom and all things will be added. Don't be consumed by those things. You'll do those things. Be consumed by what is eternal and all things. Christ will ensure that you have exactly what you need to remain faithful to the purpose of God that he spoke over your life when he fashioned you and formed you in your mother's womb. He knows what you're called to. He knows what your destiny is. He knows the purpose that he has for your life. You don't need to be distracted by things in the temporary. You focus on the eternal. Take courage today. 
Don't live according to the flesh. Live according to the Spirit, which is life. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to pray.